you would take your Bibles and look in uh, the book of Psalms to Psalm 34. It is a psalm of David, and would you stand with me and we'll read this psalm together, please. Psalm 34. The scripture says, Of David... When he changed his behavior before Abimelech, so that he drove him out, and he went away. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. The poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, O oh children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil. Keep your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace. And pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and His ears toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank You for Your Word that stands eternally. May we receive it this morning as the Word of God. May our hearts be changed. May faith be excited and expanded within us. May we see your glories more clearly. And may you be exalted among us. So we ask your blessing upon the reading and the preaching of your word. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. All of us are born with a set of instinctive fears of falling, of the dark, of lobsters, <laughs> of falling on lobsters in the dark, or speaking for the Rotary Club. And if you're a father, of those words, some assembly required. To combat the paralyzing force of fear, FDR, when a nation was gripped in the throes of deep depression, 
said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Now, I don't know if I would go that far. But it is true that if we're paralyzed by fear and we're afraid to even do anything, uh, we shouldn't, shouldn't feel that way. So spiders and snakes, girls, little kids and teenagers are to be feared for sure. But never leaving the house is taking it too far. Surely we can agree that there are healthy fears and there are unhealthy fears, rational fears and irrational fears. One of the problems that we have is taking a legitimate fear to the irrational level. One of the greatest examples of irrational fear that I know of was the communist leader of Albania from 1944 to 1985 when he died in Verhoja. I was on the way from the international airport to the capital city of Tirana. We were climbing in and out of crater-sized potholes, and my head was banging against the window because of the potholes in the road. We were in a, a Land Rover, not the soccer mom kind of Land Rover, but the kind of Land Rover that's a big white box with no suspension. I don't know why they made them that way, but you can drop them out of an airplane and they'll still go. It's like a tank with tires. Well, I noticed in the fields and along the roads, in strange and odd places, there were mushroom-like domes, some larger, some small, smaller, just sticking up out of the ground everywhere. Now, my driver didn't seem to notice these things, but I, I couldn't take my eyes off of them. Finally, I said, what's with the concrete mushrooms? And he said, they're bunkers. Bunkers. Bunkers everywhere. In the fields. Along the road. On the sidewalks at the beach, in front of the store, in the middle of town, out in the country, odd and strange places, bunkers everywhere. Moved by fear, the fear of losing power and losing control in Verhoja, slowly isolated Albania from the rest of the world. His heroes were Stalin of the Soviet Union, and Mao of China. One by one, because of his lack of trust that was moved by fear, he eliminated every ally that he had. Yugoslavia, the Soviet Union, and China. Making Albania the most isolated country in all of Europe. He was convinced that the United States, or Yugoslavia, or the Soviet Union, or all of them together, would attack Albania. And so he led a nation of three million people at the height of its population to build 750,000 bunkers in a little country that big. Bunkers everywhere. Do the math. Three million people. 750,000 Bunkers. It kind of reminded me of being a kid in elementary school during the Cold War. Our schools were designated nuclear fallout shelters. And occasionally, we would have this drill in the case of nuclear attack where we would get under our desk. I suppose the rationale was this. If you see the kid in front of you dematerialize, get under your desk. <laughs> Albania became the first atheistic state in Europe. Hosea went so far as to make all the Christians and Muslims, which made up everybody in Albania, change their names 
to one of 300 state-approved names that they claimed went back all the way to uh, Illyrica, and they would identify themselves with the Illyrians. He closed 2,200 churches and mosques, and he said that the religion of Albania is Albanianism. Hosea feared men, but he did not fear God. I suppose the fear of the Lord has three categories. There's a sense of awe and reverence that we have. There's a sense of terror and dread. Or there's just no fear. But no fear is a mirage. It's not a house. It's a hotel. You default to the dread definition when you stand before Him. Or if you're a believer and you're heading for sin, you ought to feel dread within your soul. Psalm 34, I think, is about fearing God rightly. When God is feared rightly, all other fears are subdued and held in check. Now, the superscription of the psalm recalls a time back in uh, 1 Samuel. And so if you want to hold your finger in the psalm and look with me at 1 Samuel 21, we can uh, see this time that David was before Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, who will be called in this text in 1 Samuel 21 uh, by the name of Achish. Abimelech apparently was a name that the, all the Philistine kings were called. It's like calling them king. They're Abimelech. And so here the king happened to have been Achish. And so in 1 Samuel 21, verse 10, it says, And David rose and fled that day from Saul, and went to Achish, the king of Gath. And, his, and the servants of Achish said to him, Is not this David the king of the land? Did they not sing to one another of him in dances? Saul has struck down his thousands, and David his ten thousands. And David took these words to heart and was much afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. So he changed his behavior before them and pretended to be insane in their hands and made marks on the doors of the gate and let his spittle run down his beard. Then Achish said to his servants, Behold, you see, this man is mad. Why have you brought him to me? Do I uh, lack madmen that you have brought this fellow to behave as a madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come in to my house? You know the backstory. David has finally realized that he cannot stand before Saul. He's on the run. The first place he goes is to Nob, to appear before Ahimelech, not to be confused with Abimelech, the priest. Now, obviously, David wanted to hear a word from the Lord, from Ahimelech. And while he was there, he asked for food and he asked for a weapon. So you see, David escaped very quickly. He didn't have food. He didn't have a weapon. He didn't have friends. David was all alone. He had a strange conversation with Ahimelech the priest. The priest gave him the showbread and he gave him Goliath's sword because David said, there's none like it. But he did it all under the watchful eye of Doeg, Saul's chief herdsman. David knew that Doeg would go to Saul and tell him all that had happened at Nob. So he fled to Gath, thinking, Saul will never think to look for me in Gath, or at least that's rational from my perspective. Well, the problem with Gath, though, that David may not have realized, is he was known there. His reputation had preceded him, so that when he got there, even the Philistines were saying, he's the king of the land. And... Uh, Achish, you've heard this little couplet about him, haven't you? Saul has slain his thousands, 
But David has slain his ten thousands. Now, if we're going to be afraid, now is the time to fear. Back in the psalm in verse 4, David records his fear. There was terror that he felt. He said, I sought the Lord and He answered me and delivered me from all my fears. So what will David do? Psalm 34 commem commemorates God's mighty hand in delivering David. Now it might not look like God's mighty hand. What was going on? David acted insane. He had a graffiti fest on Philistine uh, doors and gates. He let his saliva run down his beard. And Achish said, free him. The problem with us is we want God to move powerfully in our lives, but we've already figured out what it has to look like. We want the thrill of deliverance without ever being put in a position of needing it. We want a life charmed by the divine presence in which we get everything we want. We want to define our needs before God and have God meet them all. But it is God who will define our needs and it is God who will train our fears and deliver us from everyone. So in the fear of the Lord, God trained David. Now in the end of this event, David is in the cave at Adullam. The Scripture tells us. And while he's at Adullam, his father's house comes to join him. No doubt they're afraid of Saul, but they also want to see David. And while he's there, interestingly... The Scripture says everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was bitter in soul came to David. And what did David do? He said, Lord, I mean, you could have sent a better group of people, right? No, the Scripture says he became captain of them all. And there was about 400. What David did with Saul at his back and Achish in his face, he had a praise fest in the cave of Adullam. Life is hard when you're a type of Christ. If there's no crisis, if there's no crying out, there's no deliverance. If Saul doesn't seek your life, you don't run to Gath and you don't act insane and God doesn't deliver you. If there's no crucifixion, there's no resurrection. Psalm 34 is full of the language of fear and enemies and trouble and evil and subsequently crying out and deliverance. The greatest hindrance in fulfilling the Great Commission is fear. We fear the Philistines. Now, Jeremy told me this morning he's never feared a Philistine. But there are Philistines all around. They just don't look like the biblical kind anymore. They've changed on us. We fear living in third world conditions. We fear that our children will miss the advantages of Western culture, economy, and education. We fear that our colleagues that we leave behind when we go to the mission field will rise to enviable positions and we'll get left behind. We fear dying in some foreign land. We fear living in a small, smelly apartment in a high-rise apartment building with thousands of other people where the lift does not work. This first phrase I learned in Russian was lift new robotit. Don't get on the elevator, it doesn't work. We fear walking up the stairwells in the dark, stepping over drunks and in the dog poop because somebody took all the light bulbs. 
We fear malaria and following a nomadic tribe around. We fear leaving our families and not having our children know their grandparents or their extended family very well, so much so that they call their missionary colleagues aunt and uncle. We fear our kids coming back to this culture and not being able to fit in, not knowing who they are. They can't get a grip on their own identity. Some of us fear raising children. We look at our children and say, please be good. Some of us fear getting married. We don't know if the person's right. We don't know if we'll be happy. We don't know if they'll abandon us. We fear a career. Well, it could be that in our lives, what it is, we're not being careful. We're just being outright fearful. Our problem is we fear the immediate more than the eternal. It could be that what God is doing is putting us in situations so that He can tame our fears. Fear is not a value system in Western culture, yet we're the biggest afraidy cats in the whole world. You might be afraid if you wear clothes with the logo, no fear. We're afraid of being psychologically damaged by fear. Let it sink in. <laughs> but in some cultures, fear is a value. It's taught and it's learned. It's a legitimate motivation. And in the Bible, fear is a value. It carries both the idea of dread and the idea of awe and reverence. It has a meaning of awestruck reverence or trembling, tormenting dread. In the context of impending persecution as a result of being sent out by Christ to engage the world with the gospel, Jesus said this to His disciples, So have no fear of them. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear Him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Don't fear the Philistines. Fear God. If we fear God rightly our fear of the Philistines will diminish. So in Psalm 34, the psalmist instructs us in the fear of the Lord. And it's like he puts two genres of psalms together. One of praise and worship or thanksgiving. And then one of wisdom that highlights especially the idea of the fear of the Lord. It is as though the psalmist is saying that in the fear of the Lord, worship God. The fear of the Lord, the wise man said, is the beginning of knowledge. It's the foundation for knowing anything rightly. And so I want you to see in this psalm how... The fear of the Lord shapes the people of God. How the fear of the Lord shapes the people of God. First, the fear of the Lord, says David, produces awestruck praise in God's people. Because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of the knowledge of God, it produces Praise. You can see that in the first three verses of the psalm. It starts out on a high note. David is praising the Lord. He's praising Him continuously. And you'll notice that he says in verse 2, Let the humble hear and be glad. Let the one who is weak and powerless fear the Lord and be glad and offer Him awestruck praise. Now David, when he boasts in the Lord in verse 2, he's not uh, boasting because of his grand acting ability before the Philistines, but rather he's boasting in the fact that he was weak and powerless and God delivered him. 
God is calling us out of our make-believe world where we're in control and we're insulated from evil and bad. You may think this morning that you can handle that addiction. Maybe you're confident that you know how to be faithful to your spouse. Maybe you think you have all the future worked out, but I don't hear any weakness in that kind of thinking. I don't see the fear of God in it. So in verse 3, David, in his weakness, in his humility, says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt His name together. Magnify and exalt the name of God. How do you do that? It's a human impossibility. Are we going to make God great? That's what it means to magnify God. Can we make Him greater than He really is? Is, is Somehow are we adding to the greatness of God this morning as we're here? How are we going to exalt the name that is already the highest name that there is? John Piper uses the illustration of a telescope as opposed to a microscope. We magnify the Lord, he says, not like a microscope that makes something that is really small look bigger than it really is, but rather we magnify the Lord like a telescope that makes something that doesn't appear to be great appear in all of its greatness. So to magnify the Lord is simply to point to the greatness and majesty of God. You can't remove your emotion from this. This is not something that you can do just cold. Praise comes from a perception of the greatness of God. What are you communicating this morning in this place about God? When our hearts are unstirred with the greatness of God, where do we need to look? There's something lacking in our fear of the Lord. Fear in and of itself is awe and reverence at the majesty of God. It is the beginning of the knowledge of God. So the fear of the Lord causes us to feel the greatness and mystery of of God. How does God shape us? Secondly, the fear of the Lord shapes us in that the fear of the Lord leads us to cry out to God in times of trouble instead of relying on our own resources. Now you can see this in uh, verses 4 through 7. David says, I sought the Lord in verse 4 and He answered me and delivered me from all of my fears. Look at verse 6. He says, This poor man cried. That is a self-testimony. He's saying, This man, utterly without resources. Think about it for just a moment. Wouldn't it have been the logical thing for the Philistines to do to uh, take Goliath's sword and maybe cut David's head off with it? If you're going to the Philistines, you may not want to carry Goliath's sword with you. Could be a giveaway. But they set him free. He was resourceless. Before the Philistines, what could he do? He cried out to the Lord. And what did he find out when he cried out to the Lord? He said, those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. And look in verse 7. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fears Him and delivers them. David feigned insanity. He let his spit run down in his beard. Isn't that just an awful thought? It is. But what did God do? He changed His countenance from insanity to writing Psalm 34. David, in all of his resourcelessness, saw the angel of the Lord was encamping 
around about Him. The angel of the Lord is the Lord Himself. You see this appearance of the angel of the Lord in different places in the Old Testament before Abraham and uh, Jacob and Joshua and many other occasions. In the New Testament, you see Jesus. And what do you see Jesus doing? He converts the persecutor, Saul, and he stands to receive the persecuted Stephen into glory. So it's plain to see, it was plain to see on the countenance of both Paul and Stephen that they had seen Jesus. The Lord promises, in whatever circumstances you are in, I will be with you. Who are we going to fear? The one who captures us? Or the one who by His mighty hand sets us free? The one who kills you? Or the one who receives you into glory? The fear of the Lord shapes us by teaching us to cry out to God in times of trouble. The fear of the Lord also shapes us in realizing that the fear of the Lord is an evangelical expression, an experience of the goodness of God, and it leads us to compel others to fear Him too. So when we get to verses 8 through 10, you have the missiological implications of the fear of the Lord. Notice what David says, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. That's an invitation. To taste and to see. It is the language of conversion. Taste and see. Experience God and realize that God is good. Notice he equates the tasting and seeing in verse 8 with the fear of the Lord in verse 9. Oh, fear the Lord, you His saints, for those who fear Him have no lack. The awe and reverence implied by the fear of the Lord create the very context in our hearts for spiritual and moral development as a believer. So what you discover when you see and taste or when you are in awe and reverence of God is you discover the very goodness of God, you discover the very blessing of God, and you discover that you'll never lack any good thing. Someone may doubt and say, well, I don't know about the goodness of God. I don't know if I've experienced God's goodness or not. If you've ever drawn a breath, you've experienced the goodness of God. If you're not in hell, God has been good to you. You may not think so, but you've never experienced hell. Because of the Lord's goodness, those who fear Him will never lack anything. Without the fear of the Lord, there's something that is amiss in our knowledge. There's just something lacking about who we are as people. Unless we're living in the fear of the Lord and awe and reverence of Him, everything that we know has something missing in it. Why do we lack nothing? We lack nothing because the fear of the Lord is rooted in the true center of our existence. The fear of the Lord is evangelical. We fear Him and we call others to fear Him as well. The Lord shapes us forth in the fear of Him by instructing us in the fear of the Lord in the pursuit of eternal life. Now in the remainder of the psalm, the David, David is going to take up this issue. 
And he comes as an instructor, and he says in verse 11, Come, O children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? The fear of the Lord shapes, David says, the speech and the deeds of those who fear Him in verses 13 and 14. I think this psalm helps us understand David's approach to Saul. You have to think about it. For years, David fled Saul. Saul lost the kingdom right out of the starting gate. Yet the book of Acts tells us that he reigned 40 years. David, in that time, though he had been anointed by Samuel, though the Spirit of God was upon him, sustained Saul in his downward spiral. He hid from Saul and refrained from killing Saul. Saul was on a path of self-destruction. I mean, have you ever wondered what in the world was going on? I think this impacts the idea of living in awe and reverence before God. David was acting in the fear of the Lord. And I know the text says he wouldn't touch God's anointed, but it doesn't answer the question why. It's simply because David was God's grace to Saul. Even when the house of Saul finally fell and the kingdom was united under David, the first thing David did was decree, is there any left of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God to him? So the fear of the Lord David says, instructs us in the pursuit of eternal life. That is, God's people, as a result of meeting God in the grace and power of Christ, are going to be shaped. It's going to make a difference in their lives. So David outlines here the difference that meeting Christ makes. And so he's going to tell us, I think, four things about the pursuit of eternal life. In verses 13 and 14, he tells us that the fear of the Lord teaches us to pursue goodness and peace. Notice what he says in these verses. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Simon Peter gave these words their ultimate meaning over in 1 Peter. So if you want to look at 1 Peter with me, the Tim that text or the text that Tim read, not the Tim that text read, but the text that Tim read this morning, in 1 Peter chapter 3, Peter is talking about, I think, builds this text around Psalm 34, because all the way over in chapter 2, verse 3, he brings up verse 8 and says, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good, which is a synonym for if you have experienced the grace of God in salvation, it will show up in your life. And then he comes all the way over to chapter 3, verse 8, 9, 10, and on through 12. And he grabs hold of that one more time. And he talks about our relationship to one another. And he says, finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called that you might obtain a blessing. Now notice the words of the psalm. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, 
Let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. This is the language of conversion. So ultimately, the reference is to eternal life and how that heartfelt trust in Christ shapes our lives. Peter's saying that we're shaped by our relationship to Christ, not by the evil we experience in this life. It is the crowning mark of the people of God. There are two things that hinder the advance of the gospel. I think they're captured in this text in 1 Peter. One is division in the body of Christ. Division destroys our witness in the gospel. The one place on the planet, says Simon Peter, that peace ought to reign is in the family of God. Division is never the work of the Spirit of God, but rather unity, brotherly love, sympathy, a tender heart, a humble mind. You want to know where the manifestation of the Spirit of God is among us? It's among us in brotherly love, unity of mind, a tender heart, compassion toward one another. How else do you explain those realities? A second hindrance to the gospel is when we repay evil for evil. David didn't repay evil for evil. Peter cites the example of Christ when he was reviled. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. We can't take the gospel to the nations and repay evil for evil. We can't take the gospel to the nations without suffering unjustly. We're called to this. This is what Peter says in verse 9 of his text. For to this you were called. Why? To show that you've been shaped by the grace of God. So the fear of the Lord teaches us to pursue goodness and peace. The fear of the Lord also teaches us that God hears and sees us when we bear His reproach. Look at verses 15 and 16. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and His ears toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. David's life was characterized by the fear of the Lord. He realized that there was no place where he was beyond divine scrutiny. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous. And there's no place where an evil man escapes the gaze of of God. His eye is upon them in order to remove their memory from the earth. Powerful words in this text. Christ has been appointed the judge. We're not the judge. We're simply His people bearing reproach in this world for the glory of His name. God has confirmed that Christ is the judge of all the earth in that He not only gave His life on the cross, but God raised Him from the dead and through Him has appointed a day in which He'll judge the world in righteousness. The fear of the Lord in the pursuit of eternal life teaches us that we can endure hardship knowing that the Lord has a purpose in it and will deliver us unharmed. Notice what he says in verses 17 through 20. He says that when the righteous cry, the Lord hears them. He says in verse 18, the Lord is near 
to the brokenhearted. In verse 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous. And then notice verse 20, he keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. The righteous are not crying out in this text because they have a carefree life. They're crying out because God's purpose is not easy. It's not His purpose for us to have an easy life. In fact, life is ultimately going to kill all of us. So I think we're promised three things in this text. We're promised that we'll have many afflictions. We're promised that the Lord not only knows our troubles, but He's near to us in all our troubles. And we're promised third, that we'll be delivered unharmed. <clears throat> now notice, verse 20 is instructive. Verse 20 says that He keeps all of His bones, not one of them is broken. John in his Gospel quoted this verse about the crucifixion. And he says, For these things took place that the Scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. You remember that they broke the legs of the thieves with whom he was crucified. They came to Jesus, he was already dead. They didn't break his legs. They just ran a spear into his heart. Now this text is not meant to lead us to think that somehow the sufferings of Christ were mitigated. It's not going to lessen your sufferings. It's not going to make them greater if you're already dead and they break your legs. Well, what's the meaning of the text? The meaning of the text is that God was working out His redemptive plan in Christ. He was in absolute control. Think of it. Every lash of the whip, every swing of the hammer, the dividing of His garments among them, the bitter drink, the thieves at His side, the borrowed tomb, all of it, every detail was under the control and the watchful eye of God. What do we learn from that? Well, what we learn is Jesus was delivered, but He was still crucified. He was raised from the dead, but He still died. We learn that evil men did not have the last word, not even in the details of their activity. Think of it. We're not to learn that God directed the details of those men but somehow, the details of my own life are not under such scrutiny. Somehow, God is kind of backed off and maybe He comes into history strongly at some point and then at other points, He's a little more hands-off. We're not to learn that. In fact, we're to learn just the opposite, that God directs our lives. You may be on the handle end of the swinging hammer, but don't think for one moment you are acting independently of God. You're only doing what God allows you to do. You may be a drug addict or an alcoholic or addicted to pornography. 
You may be addicted to sex. You may have a clever little plan worked out to live a life of lust that no one else knows about, but don't think you are acting independently of God. What's His intent? What we learn from the text is we learn that there's a contrast between the righteous and the wicked. Between the end of the righteous and the end of the wicked. God's will is to remove the memory of the wicked from the earth, but He raised Christ from the dead. Flee to Christ. Turn away from evil. Repent. The fear of the Lord teaches us that we can endure hardship because God has a purpose in it. He has a redemptive purpose. So the fear of the Lord teaches us there is a redemptive purpose in our pain. Notice what he says in verses 21 and 22. Affliction will slay the wicked. The word affliction is also the word evil. And the text could be translated, evil will slay the wicked. Evil is not some impersonal force in the world, but evil is personal. Evil's present because there's evil people in the world. We cannot be saved unless evil people are condemned. Evil people not only hate righteousness, they hate everybody else too. And they're on a self-destructive path. Evil slays the wicked. Sooner or later, God will give you enough slack in the rope to destroy yourself. So if I am giving myself to sin, I have to realize this morning that there is God who is watching my life and I am not acting independently of God. How it ought to strike terror in our hearts to know that here I am doing this thing and God knows me. Affliction will slay the wicked. The Lord redeems the life of His servants. When we experience suffering for Christ, maybe you're suffering in your family this morning. Maybe you're suffering in your marriage. You could be suffering in ways that you've never shared with anyone. Maybe you're tempted to just give up and think, it's over, I just can't do it anymore. This text calls us to flee to Christ because what is going on in your life is not independent of God. God is seeking to redeem your life. Trust Him. What does He want us to do? He puts us in desperate situations so that we might trust God in front of the Philistines. Peter said, we're called to revile Him in order that we might obtain blessing. What was God doing in Christ's suffering? He was reconciling the world to Himself. He was acting decisively. He was redeeming a people. What's God doing in our suffering? He's redeeming us. And He's working for the redemption of others. 
The psalmist says, He redeems the life of His servants. None of those who take refuge in Him will be condemned. Suffering authenticates our faith before an unbelieving world. The fear of the Lord teaches us to hope in God. We're brought to heartfelt praise and worship. We're taught that God always works. He always works for our good. And that the wicked will not prosper. God's weaning us off this world. Off of everything that we've constructed our lives around. And He's teaching us the fear of the Lord. If we don't endure, we prove that ultimately, we don't belong to Him. If you're not walking in the fear of the Lord, be honest with yourself this morning. There's no future in evil. Really. Let's reason together for just a moment. There's no future in being wicked. There's no future in re rebelling against truth in hardening your heart against God. In fact, if you're honest, you can see that it's self-destructive. You can see the behavior that is destroying your own life. And the question is, why are you doing it? Don't think that you're in control of your life. It could be that it's simply the outworking of God's wrath. The fear of the Lord is an awesome, incredible truth. The fear of the Lord is all filled reverence for Christ. And so this morning, we're going to come to the table. In the fear of the Lord, His death, His sufferings, His resurrection, answer every issue of our hearts and lives. So this morning, I'm going to ask you, if you'll bow your head, and our musicians are going to come, and then we'll come to the Lord's table together.